Hey guys, this is the 6 star general Young Buck, and you're about to watch a video of one of the few men who outranks me in esports. Here's Thorin. I'm sure we all enjoy an energy drink from time to time, but gamer subs won't rest until they've proven they make the best in the world. They're making it sugar-free, that's keto-friendly, ladies and gentlemen. The flavors are so delicious and nuanced, you'll be ordering one, two, three, four, five flavors before you're done, because they're ace. Oh, and they've stolen the show with collaborations with all kinds of streamers and personalities in the eSports space. Of course, I'm coming in hot myself with a 10% discount you Using the code Thorin, T H O R I N N, at gamersops.gg. The game, ladies and gentlemen. Now, my commentary is not really that great because I'm just doing it off the cuff to show how it's done for an ad read. But Atlas, I mean, he's pretty good, isn't he? Because I think he's the best in all of esports. Obviously, now he is most famous for doing the LCK in League of Legends, but I'll just give him that title. I think he is the best commentator in all of esports right now. I've heard them all. I've heard them all in history. I've heard them all now. Right now, he is the best to currently do it of the active people, of the big games I follow and watch. And I include Dota as one I watch, and I don't do much work with it. He's, he's number one. Like, normally, CS Gorecasters, because of the nature of the game and the circuit and how many big stadium events normally they tend to be number one for me it's hard for the others to match up and they don't have to cater to the like little kid crowd and all the sort of walk nonsense but if you look in history it's not the best time for commentators in Counter-Strike actually like Henry Gioni just sort of came back and stuck his foot in the his toe in the pool as it were Sadikis is gone he used to be my favorite uh Atl Anders is still around still a classic voice but I, I just think certain aspects of casting other people have gotten to his level or beyond. Uh, Pansy is excellent over in Valorant, even though I don't watch the game as much. I think she's just a fantastic job every time I've heard her. But, and as I say, it's rare that I'll ever give a League of Legends commentator this state. It's like the only one I ever gave it to in the past, he was obviously doing a different role within commentary, was Monte Cristo back in his prime of 2013 to 2015. And that was even one of the reasons that people don't know I wanted to become friends with him, get to know him and to do content with him, etc. After that, I had Sadikist as my best. Then I had a period where I thought there was just a lot of good talent. It was very competitive. Right now, for me, Atlas is the best in esports. Like, first of all, in terms of his skill set, I think he's got incredibly, I think he might be the most well rounded commentator in all of esports. And hence, one of the major reasons why I think he's the best. He just doesn't have any weaknesses, seemingly. Like, he's got a fantastic sense of humor, and it's not one dimensional. It's not like it's just one style, and he just hits you with that over and over again. He can go with the floor, he can switch up to the, his, his color commentator's tendencies, you know, a tri cast. He can work with different ones, people from different backgrounds, different nationalities, etc. I've heard it said that he apparently looked up to like door and pastry time earlier in his career, and that makes a lot of sense because I actually think he combines two of their best strengths. Like for Dor, obviously humor, personality, ability to freestyle and go podcast mode when there's no action on the screen and, and add some levity, obviously. Pastry time, just raw casting, action-packed moments, great shouting voice, etc. I can see where the influences sort of stem from from this guy. In general, by the way, I think an enormous strength, and this is a really good quality if you want to be one of the best casters ever. It's why people like Sadikist and Anders were my past greatest casters is he is fantastic at collaborating with other commentators. As in, you put him into an international event or you put him with a new commentator in LCK, he's going to, not only is he going to be awesome with them and the cast's going to be really good, but he'll make them better. Like, he'll actually boost them. Sometimes they'll seem, what the hell? This guy seems a lot better. Like, I won't diss him, but I've always thought Valdez was like an all right caster, sometimes above average. I think he's maybe better in StarCraft before he came in a league. In league, I think he's had his ups and downs and he's often been on like the edge of that circle of casters in Korea. When he casts with Atlas, if you if you only heard him a bit in the past, you'd be like, who's this? It's like a new talent or something. Like I think he pairs really well with Atlas. I think Atlas has been able to fill in the areas where he doesn't do it and and elevate what he does do and make it seem really awesome by collaboration. I think back when he used to work with LS, I actually thought he really helped LS's brand. I, I've always seen LS as he is now as this like fantastic thinker, really interesting angles. Yes, he's got this crazy temperament and can be very spicy and hot headed, but at the same time, he's, he like does have good intentions on some level. He's not a malicious person, really. He just has a sense of humor that's a bit darker. 
People didn't see that LS back when he started working with Atlas. That was back whenever he used to flame him all the time and be like, he's just an elitist and an asshole and anyone who watches him is just a weird cultist. Or what LS was able to get from Atlas is Atlas helped humanize him, make sure the more fun side of him, sure that he isn't just complaining, there's not just a negative side. Doing that podcast with him, the Pog State, also started to sort of show that like, hey, LS can work in like a professional environment. He's not just a guy on his stream. It's not just a guy who's doing like uh, reaction stuff or giving crazy opinions. He can also be a professional. He can also be the best professional and work alongside other top professionals on one of the best broadcasts in the world. I think with Wolf, bear in mind he's a newer guy to League of Legends, I think actually Atlas really helped establish him and, and work around his insights and give him sort of validity and authority as an expert by filling the other side. And then if you remember, obviously the former pro Wadid, I mean now Hooney's there, but Wadid used to be there for a while. I actually thought again, notice how magically all these people during the time period they cast and work with Atlas, magically they're like one and a half times more well liked and suddenly wow people are taking notice of them and hey I never knew how good this guy was because that's the power of teamwork I've always said the best teamwork whether it's in the game or out of the game because by the way working as a casting you are dry cast very much is teamwork it's about the show more than just your individual performance the best teamwork is where my strength covers your weakness and your strength covers my weakness and all of a sudden like the best teams in history look at Jingdong Gaming now T1 back in the day Astralis in Counter Strike it looks like you have no weakness and so it means everyone looks individually better and the collective looks unbeatable that's what atlas has brought to commentary in the lck and that is no mean feat when you consider the era he was coming into the lck was when the lck was actually looking like it was going to die off a little bit and end up like the lpl is now like you'd have these western like american and european etc casters but they'd be no namers i won't mention any names now who might be doing that but they'd be the people where they're just doing it because they can't get a gig elsewhere and not because they have the love of the game and they definitely wouldn't have the best casters in the world there. I mean, the LPL right now has like one or two people that I think are good and even then they're not at the level of Atlas and they're definitely not the level of the most established casters in all of esports. So in my opinion, he came along and it was Monty and Dora early on then it was Papa Smithy heavily carrying it. Then along came Atlas and him and LS. And then he transitioned from LS when LS became the core streamer. Two other people like Wolf Wadid, Vender Valdez was there the whole time. This is this start the this era of LCK basically is just the Atlas era. Like he's the one who's defined it and he's brought the LCK right back to again being arguably the best broadcast in League of Legends esports. Also, if you're going to be a commentator, I've always said this, being as a lot of fans won't know the technical details, pacing, breath control, the most important thing to a fan is that they like your voice and your personality. I've already just said with the humans that he's got a great personality, but actually his voice, I also think his voice is really good. He's got a very pleasant voice to listen to. Now, I'm not going to meme on them because obviously like Brits and Aussies have their, a bit of ribbing back and forth. It can be an annoying accent if you have the wrong sort of toad or pitch with an Australian accent some people especially americans can find the twang a bit weird it's hard to tune the ear in i don't find that problem at all with atlas i actually found it didn't take long at all before it just became a very normal sounding voice and crucially despite having a very distinct accent I don't find ever that I get lost within what he's saying. I'm never confused. I'm never feeling like he's slurring his words together or tripping over himself. I also think now it's become not only quite a pleasant accent, I think actually it's now it's very iconic, I'd say. I could pick his voice out instantly the second I hear it. I think as well, and this is where if he was a big fan of pastry time, you did it, bro. He has got, in my opinion, the best screaming voice in esports right now. And let's be real, just like in metal, screaming is what you do on the chorus or the verse or whatever. Yeah, guess what? That is what you do in team fights in League of Legends. I think personally, like in Europe, for example, at LEC, they scream too much. They they go up to that level and it just stays there until it's over. One of the clever things I notice about Atlas's style is he can go up instantly. He can instantly go to his, his ceiling and his peak if he wants. But then if the action stops or like disc engage happens in a team fight he can then bring it right back down and be right shift the pace into like something else like back into conversational back into like right we're looking at the macro perspective now but at the same time if it looks like you know there could be a re-engage or someone's trying to flag he can also like keep track of that and then he can ramp back into it like i actually find his ups and downs one of the best aspects of a commentator and some of the best in the whole business for my money i also think when he screams this is a massive compliment if you understand any of the technical aspects of of play-by-play -play commentary when he he does do the screaming voice in the team fights. His enunciation is fucking incredible. Do you know how many people, when they scream like that, words get lost or exactly like the crispness of the full pronunciation gets lost or 
in screaming, they also speed up and then they speed up and they start tripping over their words and they start saying the wrong thing and they start like saying half a sentence and switching to another. He doesn't do that. Like it sounds like this guy is... Whereas some of the other casters, the younger ones, are just going at that blitz pace. It's He's like Neo in the Matrix. It feels like he's in that mode, but he's slowed down. And he is speaking with the screaming voice, and he's got a lot of energy and a lot of power to it. And sometimes he's speaking quickly, but he's never speaking too fast. And you can always still get it. You don't have to wait for like it to lag in your brain. And then, oh, yeah, that was a great line. You get it in the moment. And I think he's able to actually hype players and players, but without making some of those mistakes or just pushing the pedal down all the time and never letting off and using the gears as it were. And also during these team fights, look, everyone has to freestyle to some degree because you are literally making it up as you go. But he actually could say meaningful things also as well as describing the action. And like I said, I think he has some of the best ups and downs of any commentator there is right now. His pace changes are fantastic. And League of Legends, by the way, is all about pace changes. It's not as structured as certain other esports like Valorant and CSGO are. He also, and this is a massive factor for longevity, this guy's had. Here's the thing about esports. You can be a mega professional. You can come in from a different space and have an amazing skill set. You might even enjoy the game or for a while like the game. But if you don't have a true, authentic passion for the game specifically that you cast and work in, you won't endure, in my opinion. You won't be able to last three, four, five, six. You won't be able to do it. You won't be one of those people that you can cast for 10 years and still be really good, and especially not get better and better and better and better. You'll phone it in. You'll hit a level. You won't go beyond that, and you will get bored of it. You'll get burned out, especially stuff like Korean League of Legends. So many matches to cast. This guy not only has a clear passion for League of Legends, forget esports, quite clearly for Korean League of Legends. I mean, I actually think it's similar to in the past. Like, if you ever heard him when he was an amateur and he, um, just coming onto the professional scene, when he was casting the LPL back when he was in Australia, I think it was, when they were doing the OPL out of that studio. I mean, this is a guy who... Uh, in every day he does, he sounds like he's a fan of the players and the players there because here's the th secret about being authentic. It's like giving someone a compliment. You don't have to lie to give someone a compliment. There's always something about them you can compliment. Even if the person's really ugly and short and stinks of B.O., maybe, I don't know, they draw a good watercolour painting. Maybe they have a nice personality. Maybe they are kind to children. Whatever it might be, there's something you can authentically say that's positive about him. So in this particular scenario... Whatever he does, he's able to engage with somehow. Now, look, he quite clearly, and I don't see this as a negative, I think it's a very positive sign. It's, why, it's what you need for talk shows, for example. Quite clearly has his favourite players and plays he memes on a bit, and he has bias for certain teams and against certain teams and playing styles and against certain playing styles. But when he casts, you wouldn't know it in the sense that he's not being unprofessional in the cast. Like It's not infringing upon how he casts a team doing well or winning a team fight or winning a game. Even if you know from listening to him long enough that that isn't his favourite team and he wishes the other team won or he hopes that some player on the other team like wins the championship this year or something. Also, I don't think it was a big deal that they did that Pog State podcast. They always, in my opinion, every single league, major region and league needed like a regular podcast with the commentators because they don't have time and they don't have one place where they discuss all the narratives, like it's spread out across the broadcast. It's developing as the games go on, as the matches happen, as the context changes. So not only is a way to historically like update and demark what happens in the league and the narratives as they go along, but also it means if you're a casual fan or even a hardcore fan who wants entertainment and content between the matches, there's something else to keep you going and to introduce you to other players, to other commentators, to give you the more behind the scenes and give you more of like sort of a chill water cooler slash sports bar vibe as opposed to being on camera with the suit and tie and the professionalism and the Korean producers in your ear etc I think that's showed a different side of him a different side of people like LS when they were there I think it's actually been essential to being a hardcore fan of the LCK to have that podcast and he was a big part of pushing that especially for a number of years then I actually one area I obviously appreciate is historical context I think he has been around long enough now that he's seen and casted them all in terms of the LCK the modern day of League of Legends like the guy's been around the game League of Legends the whole time but like 2018 onwards he's been in the LCK I don't think people stop and take note of this because early in an esports game like think about when it was like 2014 or 2015 the reason we could all hands down be like look it's either matter or mad life's the greatest support ever because at that point the game had only been around a few years people like Madlife had played like two or three years at that point in time someone like Matter had played like two years at the top of that time the point is now 
People like Mako and Ming have played so many years. It dwarfs what people like Mad Life did. So similarly, it seems in your mind, if you watched a lot of LCK, like, well, no one will ever really, like, you know, supplant Monty as, like, one of the voices of the LCK, right? Like, the LCK in Korea is Monty's region, right? Well, I'll just tell you this. Monty was there from late 2012 to late 2016, so four years. Papa Smithy replaced him, if you remember. I mean, obviously, there was a transition period. That, that was, like, spring 2015 to late 2019. That's about four years, Maybe like four and a half or something like that. That's about four. Yeah, yeah, about four and a half. Maybe closing on five. Atlas has been there since 2018. That's six years now. So to me, he is the voice of the LCK now. And by the way, if he keeps going for more and more and more years, he's just going to own the LCK. Like eventually he will just be the name you remember and think of when you think of an LCK match. In terms of his history, if people don't know, he was doing back in the day, because he used to do it out of Australia, he was doing OPL, the Oceanic League, when that still existed, back with Papa Smithy and Pastry Time. So two people he obviously looked up to. Um, at the same time, he's doing the LPL. They used to do it out of the studio there. Then he was in the LCK from 2018 onwards. In terms of international tournaments, because obviously that's where you really get to show off your skills and potentially reach the highest ceiling, you hope, with the global audience. Back in 2018, 2019, he was just doing Rift Rivals. Then 2019, he got on Worlds. They let him do the plane. And then he did some of the group stage in the main event, but that was it. 2020, we were just online. So he did the mid-season cop, that online sort of like Asian only MSI, essentially. 2020, he got to go to Worlds. This time, he did some group stage games and then did a quarterfinal. He did that damn one game against DRX. It was obviously one that sucked. It was the Korean one. And we all knew DRX was never going to win that series ever for some reason. Then he did All-Stars that year. The next year, 20. 2021, he did MSI, but he just did the group stage. That year for Worlds, he actually got to do a quarter final. T1 against Hanwha Life. Yeah, that's right. So it was actually another all Korean matchup this time. It was like Chovy, whatever on that one, if you remember. Or oh, Chovy on DRX as well, but it was Chovy on Hanwha Life this time. And he also this time, crucially, did the final. He did EDG against Dam One, that like epic final that went to five games, and EDG won. Next year after that, last year, he did MSI, which is the online one. Obviously, he did the semi-final. He did T1 against G2, which was a rubbish match, admittedly. Then he did Worlds last year. He did a quarterfinal as well as some other games. So he did Gen G against Dam1. That point out. For some reason, apparently, by the way, I don't know if he gets the request. They just give him like quarterfinals featuring Chovy, apparently, or Chovy and, or he asks for the matches with Chovy and or Dam1 players, it would seem. I mean, obviously, you'd hope right now is putting people on the regions they're the experts about. This year, he did MSI. They gave him two of the bang series actually because he did the all Korean um, upper bracket semi-final which was Gen G versus T1 and then he did uh, the upper bracket final probably the best match of the, of the tournament T1 against JDG which is a five game banger and now he's going to do Worlds obviously to be decided what he does I would hope he's on the final of Worlds I think he's that good even though he wasn't used much internationally early on, I actually think that's sort of fair remember 2015, 2016 we're talking about like eight, nine years ago at this point in time. Like, that's a time period where he wasn't the same caster. Like, he has improved over the years. In fact, I'd say every year or two, I feel like he went up a solid 5 10%. Like, that's quite a lot, by the way, for someone who's already a professional at their job. And I do think he was a bit hard done by internationally by right in, like, 2019, 2020. If you look at the rest of the casting talent, and especially what they did with the LEC talent, and always with the LCS talent. I already think by then he was as good or better than some of them and probably should already been doing the series in the finals. But fair enough, by 2021, even Riot could see the guy is a bona fide stud and they put him on the final for Worlds. You can't really ask for much more than that. It's the biggest, basically, sort of like accomplishment for a commentator in League of Legends. And so he did did the Worlds final. And like I say, that same year, this, um, this year now, we did the upper bracket final of MSI. So he's, he's had his chances now. I hope he's certainly a mainstay now for the big finals of these massive events. Also, he has become one of the masters. Something I told him privately recently. I said, you've just mastered your craft, mate. Like, it's going to be hard for a casual fan to understand because as I said earlier, main things I think fans casually like a cast off is they like his personalities. They can put up with him talking a lot. And do they like his voice so they can enjoy the way he commentates? The problem is the nuance isn't as obvious to a casual fan because you haven't done the job, and especially not in the back broadcast world of listening with that special ear. So the technical skills can be invisible. Put it this way, D-Man was one of the best in the world in 2014. But if you brought him now, he would be incredibly amateurish. Meanwhile, even people I don't think are that mega, like I think Vedius is all right in the LEC. If you took him back to 25th, he'd seem like a genius. He'd seem fantastic. But you're like, holy moly, he's on like Monty's level. This guy's the shit. So obviously skills now... 
The difference is, D-Man used to be a multi-game cast who then did, at that point in time, League of Legends for like two years or something. People like Atlas have had like the better part of a decade to work on their craft in one game that has a certain style that to some degree it remains team fights and dragon fights and baron fights and basic laning phase stuff and then pre and post game from the draft. Like, actually, this guy is one of the people who's been putting his nose to the ground. So when people like Monty and oh, from other games, people like Sally Kist, obviously... Um, my boy, Papa Smithy, when they all left and went elsewhere, their skills stopped because they went and did other jobs. Atlas has still been grinding. He's still been leveling up. He's still been improving. He's worked and learned from all those people and casted all those different games and matches and team styles and different strengths and all the different years and metas of League of Legends. So it's actually totally logical now that he's the best. Like hard work did it. Talent did it. Uh, a level of reflectiveness did it. Actually, being able to humble your ego at the right times to work with people does it. But at the same time, to know when it's your time and you're the star and you're on the mic and to get all the great lines off. I think he's just a master. He's the best commentator in League of Legends and esports for me. So you know what? I guess with this upcoming tournament, sort of fitting that he's called Atlas, isn't he? Because, you know, you could sort of say worlds rests on his shoulders. To paraphrase the legendary DMX, I just love when y'all in my Patreon crew give me a bigger piece of cake to chew a hole through. Because obviously, one of the ways I'm able to support myself and make content like I do on this channel is thanks to my Patreon community and the likes of Ahmed Haju, Frisky, Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Animosity, Jensen Gore, Tobias Bernasconi, Tosh, Toucan, and always, always a special thanks goes out to my main man, Jerky Smith. Do you want to ask a question in my video AMA? Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest to interview? Maybe you want teasers, find out who I've already interviewed in upcoming episodes. Or do you want to take part in one of those lengthy online discussions that I do with my top patrons? Well, if any of these perks or more appeal to you, then put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today via the Patreon link below.